The governor moves to protect abortion rights in a preemptive maneuver before an upcoming Supreme Court decision. What is the future of abortion in Michigan? And at long last, the city of Detroit moves forward on recreational marijuana. Does the plan mitigate fights over licenses or create more of them? Today is Sunday, April 10th, 2022, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. A lot of focus on the United States Supreme Court this week. On Thursday, Katanji Brown Jackson became the first African-American woman to be nominated to the highest court in the land. Now, only three Republicans crossed the party line to support her. As I've pointed out here before, it's hard to imagine today. But once upon a time, the reliably liberal justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was confirmed on a vote of 96 to 3. The equally reliably conservative Antonin Scalia was confirmed 98 to zero. Those were very different times. Nonetheless, Jackson will take her place on the court at the end of the current term, and that current term will likely end in fireworks. It's expected that the Supreme Court will roll back or perhaps even completely reverse Roe versus Wade. That will send the matter of abortion back to the states. And preparing for that day, Governor Whitmer on Thursday filed suit challenging the state's 1931 law that outlaws abortion. It's a law that Roe v. Wade rendered moot, but it was never actually taken off the books. And without Roe v. Wade, the state would revert to those restrictions. You can start to see the role abortion will play in a very big election year. We're going to talk about that this morning. We're also going to talk about the city of Detroit moving ahead with a plan for recreational marijuana. It took a while to get this plan together, two years after Detroiters voted yes. But how will these licenses go out? And is it wise to add protections that give preferences to Detroit ownership, but that could muddy the matter in court? It's all today on Flashpoint. There is a general expectation that the U.S. Supreme Court will act on Roe versus Wade this summer, perhaps a tinkering or perhaps even a full rollback. Governor Whitmer took action this week to try to make sure the law that would then take over in Michigan would not be the 1931 law outlawing abortion. Now, what does that mean for a very key election year? Let's talk about it all with political strategist Adolph Mongo, pollster for Mitchell Research, Steve Mitchell, editorial page editor for the Detroit News, Nolan Finley, and from the Detroit Free Press, columnist Nancy Kaffer, who spoke with the governor this week. And Nancy, let me start with you and your thoughts on where all of this leads us. Well, hopefully, too, abortion still being a right that Michigan women can exercise. The governor's lawsuit, the intent behind this is to have that 1931 ban declared unconstitutional under the Michigan state constitution. And that way, regardless of how the Supreme Court rules, um, that right in Michigan will still be protected. Because otherwise, we're looking at a total cessation of abortion services in the state and it becoming a four-year felony for anyone who provides an abortion or potentially who receives one. Um, we've already heard some of the leading Republicans who were uh, trying to uh, displace uh, Gretchen Whitmer in the governor's office say that this is all purely political. Uh, I, I, of course, uh, abortion is a political issue, but it would seem timing wise. Did you have much of an option here, uh, Nancy? No, she did not have much of an option. And I think that to say it's political would really require you to not look at the rest of her career because she's been a fierce advocate for women's choice, mm. uh, reproductive rights for her whole career. So to imply that this is some kind of late breaking political opportunism is just really kind of an absurd suggestion. Um, and again, you know, she's asked the legislature to uh, to pass a law guaranteeing you know, women the right to choose. They have not done that. They're not going to do it. It's a Republican-controlled yeah. legislature. And with the Supreme Court prepared to rule on Dobbs, you know, there's a whole issue of legal ripeness. You know, bringing this case to the Michigan Supreme Court might not have been viable in a situation where the Supreme Court was not poised was not, to, right. uh -huh. to sure. challenge this right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Steve Mitchell, uh, the last polling I saw, a poll we did, in fact, uh, back in January, showed that more than three quarters of Michiganders did not want to see Roe versus Wade uh, overturned. I, I guess that means there's a danger here for Republican candidates if this election suddenly becomes all about abortion. Is that, is that an outlook that could happen? I think the one, uh, obviously, with President Biden's numbers being as weak as they are. I think the real problem that the uh, the Democrats have is that they're going to have a bad year. Abortion could turn that around. I personally don't think that Dobbs will be, uh, I think what they'll probably do is affirm Dobbs, uh, change the uh, time limit from 
24 weeks down to 15 weeks. And if they do that, then it's not going to be a major problem. You're right. Uh, a lot of voters, a vast majority of voters, don't want to see Roe overturned. But when you ask the question about when an abortion should occur, 54% um, say abortion at any time, but then you get into more specific details, 60% support abortion on demand in the first trimester. Support in the second trimester drops down to 30%, and in the third trimester down to 18%. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if Dobbs is affirmed, if they don't overturn Roe completely, then I don't think this is going to be a major problem for Republicans. Interesting. Adolph, how about your thoughts? Is this a big problem for Republicans? Uh, well, it's about, time, it's about time some Democrats stand up and say, okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room, and that's Roe versus Wade, and that's the crazy uh, abortion laws that uh, these Republican white men have thrown on the table to control what a woman wants to do with her body. So we need to debate it. And, and I personally think that the Supreme Court is, is going to overturn Roe versus Wade. And if they do that, hopefully this will implode the Republican Party, because I see a lot of women leaving. Wow. Going elsewhere. Uh, if, if, if they do, as Steve just said, Adolph, would, would moving, would changing it to a 15 weeks, uh, is just sort of a tinkering with a timetable, does that lessen the impact of it, of the well, issue? Well, you know what? These people are not going to be satisfied until they get an a, a outright ban. You know, whether you change it to 15 weeks, 14 weeks, or whatever, because you got folks all around the country, mm. you know, they tweaking it and they and, and they using Texas or Mississippi a, a, as a role model. So I, you know, this is not the end of it. The, the Supreme Court is is dealing with a hot potato. If, if they decide, okay, we're gonna uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, we're gonna see an all-out fight. Uh, Nolan, I, I, this, I, I, most, this would be one of the most important decisions hmm. since Percy versus Ferguson back in 1890. Pretty massive. Uh, Nolan, I, I, I think uh, Republicans seem to go back and forth. There have been times when they would love to have had an election be all about abortion, and they would love the opportunity to do something uh, about abortion law in America. And then when you look at the polls uh, and uh, the opportunity that, as Steve just described, is there for Republicans, is this... Is this the right time to have this fight if you're a Republican? Well, it's horrible timing for Republicans. And I wrote when the court took this case that the red wave that Republicans are uh, expecting this year could very well crash against this decision. Although, I mean, if you look at the Roberts court, it is not given to big sweeping rulings. I agree uh, with Steve that it's probably, probably going to tinker with the uh, timing issue a little bit, but not overturn Rob. And yet still, I think it gives Democrats a very powerful issue to run on, particularly in states like Michigan, where you have a divided legislature and the governor can position herself, or a, a divided power structure. Uh, the governor can position herself as the last defense against abortion rights. And I think that's a uh, a message that will turn out women voters. Uh, if I could make it, if I could, just, okay, if I, I could make to, it. I Steve, Steve go ahead. Nancy, I'll get to you in just a sec. Steve, go ahead real quick, and then I've got a question for you, Nancy. I had a very close friend of mine who clerked for the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He would call me from time to time, and he'd ask me about poll data because he was trying to persuade the chief to do something. Well, <laughs> they very carefully watch public opinion. They never talk about it. But yeah. they do. And that's why I think that ultimately Roberts gets probably Barrett to go with him and they get the five votes just to affirm uh, Dobbs as opposed to overturning Roe v. v. Wade, which has been the law of the land now since January 22nd, 1973, almost 50 years. So, Nancy, that's what I was going to ask you. If there is something here that amounts to more of a half a decision or a, a tinkering, what does that do? I really need to push back on the idea that if there's Dobbs is merely affirmed, that it's not going to be a big deal. Um, 24, the, this 24 week standard is viability. 15 weeks was not viability, right? So what's the difference then between 15 weeks or eight weeks or six weeks or three weeks? 
so once you throw out viability as a standard, then you have, as Adolf said, essentially opened the door to a total ban. You've opened the door to uh, conservative legislatures passing, you know, eight-week bans and heartbeat bills and all these other restrictive things. So this is idea that, like, if they merely affirm Dobbs and uphold a 15-week ban, that, that it won't be a big deal, that is a fiction. It's just not the reality of the situation. You want to jump in on that, Adolf? Listen, uh, hopefully that, that the governor uh, prevailed in this 1931 uh, law. You know, yeah, that's you, a separate you, matter. You we need to consider what happens to that. Yes. Right. You know what? We 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 got to play hardball. Those who support a woman's right to control her body, uh, there's a big fight ahead. And while the Republicans. They they um, put their agenda on the table and they acting on it. Democrats have been uh, a, a real slow in uh, reacting to what's going on around the country. So I, I'm glad to see that the governor is, is trying to do something about it. Uh, Nolan, you got to also expect that the governor would like this race to be something other than, say, her COVID response policies, right? Well, yeah, and I think, again, I think in her position as the Democratic governor in a state with a Republican legislature. And, you know, who knows if that's going to change after yeah. this election or not. She can well position herself as the, you know, again, as I said, the last uh, defense of abortion yeah. rights. I think yeah. it's a powerful message for Democrats yeah. all over the country. Uh, I, I, I do think this is terrible timing yeah. for the GOP going into a election, a post-COVID uh, election. Uh, and all of the issues they have to use against Democrats, I think this one derails it. Guys, I got to get to a break. Thanks so much for the thoughts, as always. Quick break. Back with more on Flashpoint right after this. All Gardner White stores are celebrating our grand opening sale. Hundreds of mattress door busters, like Gel Queen Memory Foam, $199. Serta King or Queen door buster price, $99. Only at Gardner White. Buckfire Law. An injury to a child is devastating. As parents, you may not be sure what to do. At Buckfire Law, we win big cases for little kids. For over 50 years, we've won life-changing settlements for injured children and their families. You've been wronged. We'll make it right. Call us, 855-BUCKFIRE. Save big at Gardner White. Hundreds of can't be beat door busters store wide. Sofas from $3.95. Five piece pub sets $3.75. Power recliners door buster priced $4.95. The grand opening sale only at Gardner White. April showers bring May flowers. But in Michigan, that's not all they bring. Think your insurance has you covered? I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. There's actually three different types of insurance you need to know about. It's heartbreaking when you don't find out until it's too late. Monday morning at 6.30, see which keywords on your policy could take you from underwater to high and dry. Monday on Local 4 News Today and streaming on Local 4 Plus. It was two years ago that Detroit voters approved recreational marijuana. It's taken since then for the Detroit City Council to come up with a licensing system, but they did that this, this past week. In a few minutes, we're going to talk with some people who hope to have those licenses, but let's start things off with the president pro tem of the Detroit City Council, James Tate. Councilman, I really appreciate the time today. Uh, we have watched Detroit kind of fall. Uh, not, quite a few other communities across the state have kind of jumped out ahead of Detroit on this, and I guess some would say, you know, why, why, why was it so much harder for Detroit to get its act together? Yeah, good morning, Devin. I mean, so, so honestly, it, it, it was, it, I'll say it was difficult, uh, certainly because it, we wanted to make sure we kept social equity and our, our legacy Detroiters uh, at the forefront. Uh, if, if you recall, and you kind of talked about it, we actually put an ordinance out and approved it uh, unanimously on city council uh, in November of 2020. And right. here we are in 2022. So we we didn't we didn't slow walk this. We have been very uh, strategic about how we approached it. And many of the cities that you look at around the metropolitan area, they don't have an equity uh, uh, an element of social equity included. 
It is increasingly important for us to ensure that we do it because Detroit has been overwhelmingly uh, disproportionately impacted by uh, marijuana arrest. And so uh, taking the time to do our best to ensure that we work within the framework of the law uh, to address those ills of the past, uh, but then also providing an opportunity in the future and the present uh, is a bit difficult, but I believe that we have hit uh, as close to the mark as we can based upon the uh, uh, the laws that we have in, in the land. Well, let's talk about that because you, we, the uh, the words equity and legacy uh, are a big part of what of the work that you've been doing. They kind of amount to preferences. I'll be honest with you, Councilman. I get uh, a little PTSD when we talk about preferences because I always think back to the original deal on casinos. Preferences were set aside uh, for, I guess, what you would have at the turn at the time referred to as legacy Detroiters. It meant that we missed out on Mirage, which was. Is going to create the biggest casino, the largest employment picture, because the license went to the Greek Town Group. The original Greek Town Group went bankrupt. I still don't know how a casino goes bankrupt, but I guess some would say, look, what this needs to be guided by is the best business practices, best business sense, rather that, that preferences kind of lead you down a troubled path. Yeah, I hear that. I mean, and, and everyone has a right to an opinion. Uh, as, a leg as a Detroiter myself, lifelong Detroiter, and as a government official who has to identify how to um, create, shape policy that affects not just us in today's world, but how it will have a reverberating effect moving forward, I have to always keep my eye on, again, today as well as tomorrow. So business, business minded, I mean, we could have flipped the switch literally after the voters approved it. Uh, sure. Um, adult use in 2018. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the goal is not just about dollars for the city. The goal has been about making sure that we provide the best avenue, because we can't guarantee a license, Devin. What we provide the best avenue and best opportunity for those who have been disproportionately impacted by uh, marijuana arrest. Uh, but again, I always say this is a this, this is a very uh, cutthroat industry. Yeah. And if if we do not as government do whatever we can to help remove barriers or at least lessen those barriers to the point that we can, then I'm failing in my job. Uh, you also want people to understand that there's some fluidity to this. Uh, one of your colleagues, there was only one vote against for Mary Waters, and that's because she felt like there wasn't enough protection uh, for the people you're talking about. She said, as she put it, the licensing system was broken. I don't think you think that this is all necessarily set in stone at the moment. Now, what, what, what I will say is uh, to my colleague and anyone else, um, if you have a better option, put it on the table. And it was not put on the table. It's one thing to vote no, um, but it's another thing to put up a better option or a different option. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, if eight to one city council voted on it. I think that's a pretty impressive yeah. uh, mark, especially when you're talking about a, a licensing ordinance that affects the entire city. Uh, this ordinance, as I've said from the very beginning, is not perfect. Uh, you're going to be very hard pressed to find a perfect ordinance. Uh, but what we do have is an element that addresses uh, uh, elements of, of resources. We address the elements of equity itself. Uh, we also are encouraging partnerships when, when, when available. Uh, so um, we're just not going to be able to hit every mark. I, I know that for a fact. We've already been uh, told that we're going to get sued. We know that's the, the fact as well. <laughs> the issue, Devin, is can we defend the lawsuit? And we've gone through numerous cases around the country uh, and really, really poured into that. That really took a lot of time to make sure that whatever we put in place this time around for sure uh, will uh, stand the scrutiny of courts. And we, we honestly, certainly uh, completely believe that's the case. Legal struggles are no doubt ahead. It was already a legal decision that kind of helped delay this uh, on the original uh, intent of trying to create uh, uh, preferences uh, in the structure as well. Uh, Councilman Tate, always good to have you on the program. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me as well. Then. You bet. Good morning. All right, so let's move now to the other side of this deal, and that's those who are wanting to be licensed, including many already licensed as medical dispensaries. I'm joined now by Jay Snipes, Chief Operating Officer of West Coast Meds, and John McLeod, the co-founder of Cloud Cannabis, which has uh, a number of facilities now uh, all around the state. But you are both uh, kind of in that pool that I just mentioned. And Jay, I guess I'm starting to wonder, is there still a role for medical dispensaries if everybody is going to be rushing to get these recreational licenses does it can you operate as a can you survive as a medical only marijuana facility now jay well it's definitely a struggle at the moment because uh, we are medical only and many other places are recreational 
However, we are doing our best to stay open for our patients that are in need of uh, medical marijuana. Uh, John, I think you feel that it, that's kind of, it, it's sort of doomed if you, if you can't get a uh, license for recreational now. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And, and the numbers prove that to be, I have medical, a medical only store in Traverse City. And then of course, as you're pointing out, Detroit is medical only. And the amount of patients has shrunk dramatically in the state thus far. And we're really competing for a very small slice of the consumer pie. And, you know, we're absolutely right. We want to still cater to the medicinal market in the state of Michigan, but we can do that through recreational products, air quotes, recreational mm. products um, at, at these stores, regardless of if they have a medical designation or not. Well, let's jump back now to the, to the decision just made by the council. Uh, Jay, uh, you, you've had a, a couple of days now to look over uh, what they've done. They're obviously trying to create a preference for Detroit ownership. Uh, do you feel like uh, what they've done is going to create more fights over the way we move forward, or have they made it pretty clear on, uh, on a path now for everybody trying to get the licenses? Well, either way, there is no pleasing everybody. Um, so you're going to have your complications with whatever ordinance you come up with. You know, some businesses are going to be acquisitive and because the ordinance really is for everyone. It gives everyone an opportunity to start off with at least one store and um, that way it can start pouring back into the community as well. So it gives everyone a fair opportunity, but it may not be perfect quite yet. Uh, John, your thoughts on the way this is going to work? Yeah, I agree with Jay. I mean, listen, the Councilman Tate and the, the City Council has tried really, really hard to bring forth an ordinance um, that is inclusive of everyone. Um, there is potential generational wealth that comes out of the cannabis industry. And City of Detroit residents, legacy Detroiters should absolutely be able to have a slice of that pie, no question. I think in this second iteration of the ordinance, it expands the numbers which makes it a little bit more inclusive for all and hopefully will stand up to any uh, litigation that may arise. But I think, I, you know, I commend the Detroit City Council for trying very, very hard to do the right thing. Yes. Uh, well, it, it took them, that, that's part of why I guess it took them two years, didn't it? Uh, but I'm curious as to how we move forward now in a zoning sort of way, and this will be a conversation I'll need to have, I guess, with council members again. But you both know that even though uh, Detroiters and Michiganders in general, but Detroiters overwhelmingly approved recreational marijuana, we've already seen in so many communities, voting yes doesn't mean that you want one in your neighborhood or a, a place down the street. So wh what do we do now to try and... Uh, and figure out the best zoning steps forward. Jay? Well, um, we have plenty of real estate opportunity in the city of Detroit. It's yeah. empty, it's vacant. So I know some people are not used to uh, cannabis stores being in their community. However, if we take away the negative, if we really take away the negative and put and think more positively, like giving back to the community is is a big thing for many of the people that I work with and um, just pouring money back into that immediate community that they do do business with. Mm -hmm. We are a part of, we've helped, we've donated to Butts, so we did back to school giveaways. So if they, they try to adjust and adapt to the now, and I know it's not something a lot of us are used to, and understand the positive aspects that it can pour back into our community in a major way. This is a billion dollar industry that can yeah. affect our community immediately. It is, there's a massive amount of money connected to it, that's for sure. John, your thoughts on the uh, not in my neighborhood uh, string that, we, we'll, that you're gonna bump up against quite a bit. Yeah, it's interesting. So we, you know, fortunately where we're located on Mac Avenue, we've had a really good relationship with the Morningside community. Uh, we have a good working relationship with the Mac Avenue Business Association. And what Cloud really focuses on doing is hyper-local engagement. And, and I know that's very unique to the cannabis industry in general. We really want to fold in our community into our good deeds. It's a, um, it's a business that has a lot of opportunity to give back both financially, but also in donation of time donation of services, yeah. and lastly, in jobs. The creation of jobs is a, is a huge benefit to the local community. I know we at Cloud Cannabis, we try to get as many active uh, commuters as possible to be employees at our stores. And these are walkers, busers, bikers. These are people that are not dragging the loads on the roads or adding to emissions 
or coming from different municipalities into a community to work. These are people that are working in stores that are in their neighborhoods. Yeah. And oh, that right there is a huge advantage of the cannabis industry in Detroit it, that not being fully realized. It frames the it frames your challenges pretty well as we've you've both just described it. Thank you so much. I pre I know you've got you both have got a long way to go here uh, as you try to figure out the path forward, but thanks so much for the time today. I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for having us. You bet.